Hello and welcome to Facebook live session of World Parkinson's program. It's sunny in Toronto and spring is around the corner. Thank you for joining us. We'll be taking your questions and answering uh, for the educational purposes. We hope that uh, you are benefiting from uh, these sessions. Uh, please give us your feedback uh, on these uh, live sessions uh, so that we can modify them to get the maximum benefit to the people and uh, we can train ourselves to uh, improve and how to do them in a better way. We are all learning. We have a question. Uh, does pain happen in Parkinson's? Uh, and why? Uh, pain in Parkinson's disease is uh, not uncommon. Uh, pain happens in about uh, two-thirds of patients with Parkinson's disease. Uh, however, uh, many patients uh, uh, don't know that uh, pain is uh, uh, associated with Parkinson's disease and therefore uh, they may not uh, uh, bring this uh, in discussion when they are seeing uh, their neurologist. Uh, the pain in Parkinson's disease is uh, quite uh, quite underreported and uh, understudied. Uh, not much research has been done on pain uh, with respect to uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and the pain in Parkinson's disease uh, uh, could be due to many other reasons because most of the patients with Parkinson's disease, uh, they are elderly, so they could have some other comorbidities uh, such as uh, osteoarthritis or other types of arthritis, uh, bony deformities, skeletal issues, uh, as well as other conditions uh, such as polyneuropathy. And these conditions, when combined, they could cause pain. Many patients may have back pain, which uh, could be due to uh, degenerative changes uh, in their back. Uh, so the pain in Parkinson's disease uh, has to be differentiated whether this is due to Parkinson's disease or any other coexisting condition. The pain in Parkinson the, uh, the pain in Parkinson's disease is uh, uh, a problem in some patients and it could be quite intense and very difficult to treat. Uh, there are many different uh, uh, types of pain. Uh, when experts uh, 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 talk about pain, they divide that into many different types, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, pain uh, due to nerve damage type of pain, uh, which is associated with numbness and tingling and affects more uh, feet and toes uh, as compared to the upper body. And similarly, pain due to cramping of uh, feet uh, which is not uncommon early in the morning. Some patients would wake up early in the morning and they would have cramping or turning in of their toes and feet. Uh, so this cramping sometimes uh, becomes a means, uh, becomes uh, uh, so bothersome that they wake up early in the morning. Uh, this cramping type of pain may be more common in young onset patients, patients who have Parkinson's disease uh, in relatively younger age. The other types of uh, pain could uh, be radicular pain, uh, which usually is described as a shooting pain starting from the back and going uh, towards the legs or starting from the upper body and going to the arms. Uh, so, And some patients could uh, describe their pain as an inner restlessness. They feel that their body is restless inside uh, and uh, uh, they sometimes uh, feel a need to move or they feel that uh, uh, some type of uh, trouble is going inside the body and uh, the other people, they, they can't describe it. Uh, so uh, various uh, uh, types of pain have uh, various mechanisms. Uh, experts do think that there is a central deafferentation of pain processing areas in the brain. Uh, which causes uh, pain in patients with Parkinson's disease. And then there is a pain which is uh, 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 non-specific and non-localizable. And that type of pain uh, could happen due to Parkinson's disease and patients uh, uh, cannot describe it very well. This type of pain uh, is not consistent with uh, other types of uh, known pain syndromes. Uh, uh, the pain, uh, according to some studies, some research studies, have reported that uh, 
uh, the pain in Parkinson's disease uh, is associated with uh, uh, less intake of pain medications or analgesics. Uh, it is not reported uh, to the uh, physicians, uh, but in uh, certain cases, as uh, I was just saying, that pain could be quite disabling. Uh, some patients just have this uh, intense pain, and uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's worse when, uh, when, when uh, their medications uh, for Parkinson's disease are wearing off. Uh, and uh, again, when they take uh, levodopa, the pain, uh, or other dopaminergic medications, the pain improves for uh, that time. Be, uh, for that time, and then as there's a time for the next uh, medication, they start getting pain. Some patients with Parkinson's disease could have, could have low back pain, and low back pain uh, becomes very difficult to differentiate whether this is due to Parkinson's disease or due to degenerative changes in, in the back, in the spine, uh, because in that age group, it's not uncommon to have some uh, degree of degenerative changes uh, in the low back, uh, which um, is seen in many patients, and they do have pain, and if they happen to have Parkinson's, then it becomes a dilemma whether the pain is due to Parkinson's disease or it is due to uh, the uh, due to the degenerative changes uh, in the low back. Uh, so pain in Parkinson's disease uh, uh, is very poorly understudied, uh, uh, as I said, and. Uh, uh, with respect to uh, with with respect to diagnosis, uh, usually uh, the if if patients uh, have diabetes or if there are any other conditions uh, that could lead uh, to uh, polyneuropathy of nerve damage, then these patients do undergo uh, nerve connection studies uh, to see whether uh, the pain is due to uh, polyneuropathy if they have. Uh, uh, more back pain, uh, then they, these patients do need uh, the imaging of the back, such as uh, MRI uh, and other investigations. Uh, there is no definite uh, uh, one treatment for pain in Parkinson's disease uh, because the pain is of many different types. Uh, and uh, in some patients, uh, the, uh, the dopaminergic medications will work to help their pain. And in other patients, the, uh, the medications for pain uh, which are routinely used, uh, uh, such as Advil or Tylenol, uh, may help to some extent. And in certain cases, we use medications such as pregabalin uh, or gabapentin. Uh, uh, so sometimes the patients may uh, need uh, a different combination of uh, 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 treatment or a different combination of uh, uh, a different combination of medications uh, to to help their pain. In addition to medications, certain other, uh, uh, um, other strategies or modalities uh, such as physiotherapy uh, might help. In some cases, massage uh, might be helpful, uh, hydrotherapy or uh, swimming uh, and uh, uh, going in uh, sauna or uh, pool might be uh, to some extent uh, partially relieve uh, pain of these, uh, symptoms, uh, these patients. We have another uh, uh, question whether uh, restless legs syndrome is related to Parkinson's disease. Uh, I think we might have touched on this in our previous uh, uh, sessions. Uh, restless legs uh, syndrome uh, is a disease entity by itself. Uh, patients with restless legs syndrome uh, have uh, a desire to move their legs, especially when they're sitting stationary. They have this creeping and burning feeling, which they describe with uh, various uh, uh, ways uh, such as numbness or tingling or uh, burning sensation or jumping feeling in their legs. Uh, so they, this, this feeling mostly uh, affects their uh, legs between knees and ankles. Sometimes it may affect uh, all of the leg and, uh, and, and in other cases um, upper limbs may be affected as well. So these patients uh, develop this uh, a need to stretch their legs. And this uh, need is worse uh, when they are sitting stationary 
for example, if they are watching uh, movies for a longer period or if they are taking a flight in plane or taking a uh, car ride as a passenger, so they start noticing that they have to move their legs quite often to relieve these symptoms. If these patients stand up and they start walking, this symptom uh, does go away, uh, at least partially, if not completely, and these symptoms usually start in the late evenings uh, as uh, the evening increases. As the time goes by, they start developing these symptoms and uh, uh, this does cause them trouble falling asleep. They might go in bed and they might not be able to sleep. So restless leg syndrome could occur on its own. Uh, and uh, in different uh, uh, studies, uh, the, uh, the incidence of restless leg syndrome has been reported uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent in general population. Uh, uh, but in cases of Parkinson's disease, restless leg syndrome could be associated with uh, uh, patients who have Parkinson's, and in those cases, in, and in some cases, uh, up to 20-25 percent uh, of the incidence has been reported. The restless leg syndrome, which uh, occurs in Parkinson's disease, is usually milder as compared to when it occurs on its own. It may be easier to treat when it uh, occurs with Parkinson's disease as compared to when it occurs as a separate entity. Sometimes restless leg syndrome could be related uh, to pain and uh, uh, a variant of restless leg syndrome, which is called painful variant, has been described as well. So, uh, with respect to Parkinson's disease, because these patients are already slow, they spend most of their time sitting uh, in either a, uh, in a chair or wheelchair or just lying in bed. So, they get bothered by restless leg syndrome more than other people because their mobility is less, they are not able to move around to relieve their symptoms. Um, the restless leg syndrome in Parkinson's disease could be, uh, could be confused uh, with other symptoms such as patients with Parkinson's disease have sensory symptoms of numbness and tingling in their legs and, uh, and sometimes they may have uh, uh, symptoms uh, of uh, feeling quite uncomfortable or uh, uh, they are uh, feeling uh, that something is moving uh, inside their body which is referred as akathisia. So akathisia and sensory symptoms and pain, uh, which is related to Parkinson's disease sometimes, it could be mistaken uh, as restless leg syndrome. Furthermore, uh, the, uh, the nerve damage or polyneuropathy has been uh, increasingly described in association with the restless leg syndrome. Patients um, who have uh, been taking levodopa, they may develop uh, uh, B12 uh, deficiency. Uh, so as uh, time goes by, if these patients are uh, on uh, levodopa for longer periods, and then uh, so they could develop a, uh, they uh, they could develop a polyneuropathy, and this polyneuropathy then uh, could be mistaken for restless legs syndrome. So patients with restless legs syndrome uh, at night time they may have. Uh, association with limb movements, so they might uh, move their legs, uh, jerking of legs uh, or moving around, uh, which are called periodic limb movements uh, of sleep, it is not uncommonly associated uh, with restless leg syndrome. About half of patients who have restless leg syndrome, they may have periodic limb movements uh, of sleep at night time, <clears throat> and therefore it's important to take their history uh, uh, that when they are sleeping, do they have these movements? Their spouse <clears throat> or anyone who has observed them during sleep uh, on a daily basis uh, would be able to give this uh, piece of history. We have a question um, whether allied health professionals do you recommend for a PD patients? Let's finish this restless leg syndrome discussion and then we can... Uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, the um, the other allied professionals. Uh, so uh, patients with restless legs uh, syndrome, uh, they get quite bothered, if especially if they have Parkinson's disease. And for restless leg syndrome, uh, however, the medications um, which remain to be the treatment of choice are dopaminergic medications such as premipexol, rupinirol. Uh, in addition to this, pregabalin uh, as well as gabapentin uh, could also be 
the treatment uh, uh, which is used commonly uh, for these patients. Uh, so <clears throat> it, it should be screened on follow-up visits and then treated accordingly. We have another question. Uh, my mom has advanced Parkinson disease. She has painful cervical, uh, cranial foot dystonia and getting Botox, but not uh, too effective. Uh, so can we see the other part of the question? So, but not so effective sometimes. She is very uncomfortable and getting extreme anxiety, severe arm uh, and hand tremor, sweating, uh, debilitation, last four hours. Uh, should higher doses or different brand of Botox maybe try other suggestions? <clears throat> uh, patients with uh, Parkinson's disease could have uh, uh, dystonia uh, as uh, a symptom. Uh, so uh, sometimes <clears throat> patients have a very uh, specific dystonia. A, a small number of patients could have a cervical dystonia which is very prominent uh, and it would look like uh, any patient who does not have Parkinson's disease and they have cervical dystonia. The exact relationship of uh, cervical dystonia with Parkinson's disease uh, remains unknown. <clears throat> However, some patients uh, could have uh, uh, pain uh, due to cervical dystonia. In others, it could be just the abnormal posture of head and neck. Can I see it again? Yeah. In some patients, it could be just the abnormal posture of neck, and other patients, it could be uh, it it could be that uh, uh, they have uh, pain. Uh, so, <clears throat> patients with Parkinson's disease uh, not only could have cervical dystonia, but they could have dystonia of foot or dystonia of the hands. Uh, you would see with advanced Parkinson's disease, their fingers adopt the dystonic position, they, uh, they bend abnormally, and these patients have difficulty opening. This causes extreme, uh, uh, extreme problems with the use of hand, uh, and these patients may have sweating. Uh, so uh, these, uh, these problems uh, would worsen as the disease progresses. Uh, the dystonic uh, posturing could cause pain in some uh, patients, and the pain could be extreme in certain cases. Uh, so uh, in this question, they have described multiple symptoms uh, that uh, uh, these patients uh, uh, this uh, this typical patient has anxiety and tremor, uh, anxiety, tremor, episodic sweating. Uh, these are all symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and they could be independent of dystonia. Debilitation uh, happens because these patients are not mobile, they are not eating well, though, so they start losing weight and they become weak. Uh, with respect to dystonia, uh, the uh, one of the most effective treatment of dystonia is the botulinum toxin. The botulinum toxin, uh, just for the education purposes of other people uh, who might be uh, joining with us uh, in this discussion, botulinum toxin is uh, a toxin uh, which is uh, derived from bacteria and is uh, used uh, in uh, uh, in injecting those muscles which are hyperactive in dystonic patients. It is the same drug which uh, people use to fix their wrinkles. So uh, in these patients, uh, the botulinum toxin is uh, uh, helpful. Uh, however, the uh, botulinum toxin provides uh, a partial relief. In most patients, you can get anywhere between uh, 60 to 80 percent relief of symptoms if the dystonia is mild. However, if the dystonia is advanced and is uh, Mm, uh, and, and if they have fixed posture, the, the effect may be uh, less and less. Uh, so uh, with respect to dystonic posturing, uh, certain uh, things in addition to Botox, uh, in addition to Botulinum toxin may be helpful, uh, such as if they have dystonia of hand or dystonia of foot, 
The splinting might be very useful. So these patients should be injected with uh, botulinum toxin and then they could use the splints. If their fingers curve, then they can use the uh, splints, which are commonly used for carpal tunnel syndrome, which can help them uh, to keep their fingers straight. In addition to this uh, exercise, uh, if patients can't do exercise, then someone else can do the passive stretching of their arms. Uh, so that is helpful as well. So those patients who, uh, who don't get uh, relief uh, from just botulinum toxin, they could try other medications. If uh, uh, patients uh, uh, are not elderly and if they don't have uh, other conditions uh, such as uh, dementia, so then these patients could also benefit from a small dose of anticholinergic medications such as trihexyphenidyl, although they could cause uh, anticholinergic side effects in many patients, especially if they are seniors. So in addition to this, massaging these patients or, um, or, or gentle exercise uh, could also be helpful with respect to uh, anxiety and uh, uh, other symptoms. Can we do it the other way? We have to turn the screen upside down because the question is too long. Yes, uh, the different uh, uh, different dose uh, types of uh, brand of Botox. If patients don't uh, usually get a relief from uh, one type of botulinum toxin. Uh, they may not find the other type of botulinum toxin very helpful because the, because the other brand would have the same uh, mechanism of action. So as I said, uh, the other medications which uh, could be given with it, uh, such as gabapentin, in some cases medications such as baclofen could be tried uh, in low doses. So these patients uh, with Botox, uh, with botulinum toxin, uh, exercise uh, as well as uh, supplementing and medications such as gabapentin, pregabalin uh, and uh, baclofen uh, might uh, get some more relief. It seems that the time is up and uh, we'll be stopping very soon. So uh, we'll see you next uh, uh, Sunday. We have a question, uh, a short question. What other allied health professionals do you recommend for PD patients? Yes, in terms of allied health professionals, it depends what type of problems patients have. So in the beginning of the course of uh, the condition, uh, these patients uh, are usually uh, good with uh, just a low dose of uh, uh, the, um, dopaminergic medications and they may not need help of uh, uh, other uh, allied health professionals. However, uh, doing uh, a regular exercise, which can be done, uh, patients can do that uh, on their own or they could see uh, physiotherapists who can recommend them which exercises are good and which they should try to avoid uh, and then they can continue exercises on their own. So physiotherapist is always helpful in terms of guiding patients uh, you know, what exercises they should do. 
In addition to that, as the condition advances, patients uh, uh, may need to see a speech and swallowing therapist because patients uh, do develop speech problems as Parkinson's advances and they do uh, have trouble with swallowing. So speech and swallowing therapist evaluation is very useful in these patients and they may have to see them uh, more than few times as they can advise with dietary modifications um, as the disease progresses. So furthermore, uh, the patients may benefit uh, uh, from uh, from occupational therapists who can help them to uh, guide uh, uh, which uh, activities uh, uh, they can uh, do better in terms of uh, if they have a problem with dexterous movements uh, because patients usually start noticing trouble with writing, uh, they start noticing trouble doing fine motor tasks such as fastening their buttons, brushing their teeth uh, and so on. So help of a occupational therapist might be, um, might be needed as the disease progresses. In addition to healthcare, in addition to them, uh, other healthcare professionals, uh, such as seeing a dentist on a regular basis, if patients have a, a problem with drooling uh, or problem with oral health, is helpful. Having a good accountant is also helpful because they can help them uh, to uh, to make sure that they have a good plan uh, for their medication coverage as. Uh, uh, with the progression of disease, patients may need uh, more medications to be added to their treatment regimen and they need to make sure that they have good health insurance, not only covering the medications but also the cost of physiotherapy and other treatments as uh, may be needed. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we'll see you next, uh, hopefully we'll see you next Sunday uh, and uh, thank you for being us. Uh, for details, uh, uh, about our other educational activities, you may visit the website of World Parkinson's Program, uh, www.pdprogram.org. Uh, uh, World Parkinson's Program uh, is a Canadian-based charitable organization which uh, uh, helps uh, patients uh, to improve their quality of life and provide them better treatment, uh, especially World <coughs> Parkinson's Program. Uh, is the only global organization which provides medications to the patients, patients who cannot afford uh, buying medications. Um, so World Parkinson's program tries to help them to get medications, uh, to have walking aids, uh, and it provides educational literature, uh, which is available in uh, more than 20 languages uh, in, uh, in, uh, to be used in various countries and various communities. Uh, because education uh, is the first step in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. So please uh, uh, visit their website, www.pdprogram.org, and also please share this information with your friends so that th they can join us in our live Facebook sessions and they can benefit as well. Thank you for being us, and hopefully we'll see you next Sunday.